de trois. Un de trois. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this talk is using neuroscience to evaluate the influence of media richness on the cognitive and emotional engagement in MOOCs. Please welcome Pierre Marjorie Leger. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, bienvenue à Montréal. Uh, welcome to HEC Montreal. So uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be uh, speaking at this conference. Uh, I'm a professor here at HEC Montreal. Uh, in information technologies, uh, and I'm a researcher in the field of, uh, you know, studying humans in interaction with different types of media, whether it is mobile phone, tablets, or computers, in different types of contexts. And today, uh, I want to uh, bring to you research that we do at my lab in using neuroscience and neuropsychology to study specifically how we can um, uh, understand engagement, emotional and cognitive engagement of learners in MOOCs. So we've conducted a study with collaborators here from, the, uh, from HSC Montréal, including Jean Talbot here that is uh, uh, with us. And I'm here to present you the results of a study we've conducted last year with a MOOC that was designed here at HEC Montreal. And uh, on, uh, we used the EduLib platform that was developed here at HEC uh, to, uh, to diffuse the content. So, a few words of, of, about what uh, I do as a researcher. So, uh, I'm here at HEC Montreal. I'm a co-director of a lab called Tech Tree Lab. And this lab uh, is, is about using neuroscience uh, tools and theories to better understand users. So we have access in our lab to a wide range of technology from neuroscience, including, uh, for example, here, electroencephalography to measure uh, cognitive activities of, of users. Uh, we uh, would use physiological measure, eye tracking, facial automatic facial analysis uh, to study how users interact with technology. For example, here, with a tablet, mobile phone, or even with you know, more than one user uh, in the context of gaming, for example. And uh, studying this is about understanding what happens during an interaction. It's often in our field in psychology or uh, in uh, education, we're bound to study uh, the perception of users or only their behavior. And in, in our context, we're specifically interested by, by monitoring what happens automatically and unconsciously uh, on the user side uh, while uh, interacting with the technology. This study uh, is specifically on the topic of media richness or production style. Uh, and when we started this with Jean, it's, it's all about the cost of de developing a MOOC. Is it worthwhile to invest so much money in, de in developing MOOCs that are kind of national geographic kind of uh, uh, production style, right? Uh, it's a lot of money to develop MOOCs, and could we develop MOOCs with only you know, a camera in a room like this, filming professor in interaction with student, would that be enough? Right? So somehow uh, this topic has been studied different from different ways, uh, but our take on this is to study specifically what happens from a cognitive and emotional reaction of users. Does it change something to invest money and make a media that is really capturing the attention of the, of the learner to in eventually create a better engagement and having better results on the learning so learning side. So this, so this study is really like using a microscope to study engagement compared to other studies that has been done so far at using mostly um, uh, behavioral data. So about behavioral data, MOOCs, and you know about this, uh, generates a lot of data. And there's a lot of researcher right now using analytics data from MOOCs to understand you know, why people you know, how to motivate people, how to engage them, and, you know, having them to finish and complete a, uh, a study program. And, you know, data like this helps you as designer, as, as instructor, to, to evaluate how well your, your, uh, your material has been developed and the impact it has. But to use a ca Canadian analogy, it's like looking at people walking in the snow, right? You, you know where they're going, you know, you know what page, what video they've downloaded. Uh, you have some information about them. You may know, you know, are they, you know, a man or woman, their age, where they're from. Here, the analogy is that you would have like their shoe size, maybe some information about their weight, but you have no idea how they feel, right? You have no idea of their emotion. You don't know the extent to which you're boring them with your, with your content. 
you don't know if your content actually creates an overload and that the subject is unable to appreciate the content of the learning. Or it's just like, do not understand what you're saying, right? So you have no idea from an emotional and cognitive standpoint what they really feel. You only have where they walk in the snow. So again, our approach is using somehow like a microscope approach to understand emotional and cognitive uh, reaction to get to that, right? To really capture when a learner is engaged emotionally, cognitively with the content and reacts in a positive way to the, the, the content that you're providing. In, in education, a lot of studies we've, we've done in the past in this field, uh, we kind of study uh, uh, attitudes and knowledge with pre-post tests, right? So if you were to, to look at the effectiveness of a training, you would you know, use maybe a, a knowledge test before the content and after the content to somehow measure the delta, right? How, how much learning happened during the training. The other way is to use also self-perceived scales to, you know, to what attitude you have toward a, a, a typical subject or your self-perceived knowledge about a, a, a specific topic. In, in every case, it's about taking the learner as a black box. You're looking at the learner, you're, you're, you're seeing where the learner walks in the snow, but you don't really know what's happening in the black box. Right? And somehow using neuroscience tools is about opening this black box and understanding you know, what the user is, is the learner, is really uh, uh, emotionally and cognitively engaged with the content. So uh, emotional uh, measure engagement, engagement is a, is a construct in the uh, educational literature that's been studied uh, uh, in, in many contexts and is somehow def uh, a multi-dimensional construct, right? There are many dimensions to this construct. And most of the time is study toward a, a self-perceived or behavioral engagement approach. Looking at, you know, what people are doing is uh, somehow a proxy of their uh, involvement in the course, right? They are acting, therefore they are engaged. Well, engagement is more than that. It covers also their emotion, their positive or negative emotion uh, to the content, and therefore, somehow, the, 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 uh, the premise of emotion is that because, because you're reacting to the content, somehow you're tied to, 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 the, to the learning or to, 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 to uh, the, uh, the, the, the context in which you're learning. You're, you're emotionally bound to what you're learning. The cognitive element is that whatever you're trying to learn, you need to invest cognitive resources in, in the topic if you want to appreciate and, and learn from it. And some level of mental workload is, is required to invest uh, to learn. So the, these three dimensions needs to be taken into account when it comes to, learn, to measuring engagement and not just behavior. I mean, sometimes we cannot study emotion and cogn cognition when you're just looking at the megadata that we're, that we're generating with MOOCs. And sometimes we need uh, a more lab-oriented approach, and this is what I'll propose in this study. So coming back to our question, uh, we know for sure that it costs a lot of money to produce very nice-looking MOOCs. And uh, some study would report that it costs at least, you know, 25% of the total cost of a MOOC can go toward graphic designs uh, and uh, video, video editing. And that, in my view, may be even a conservative estimate. I've done many MOOCs in the past, and I would say that you know, 25% could be, you know, at least what I've put in, in building the MOOCs, could go up to, I believe, you know, up to 40%. So there's, there's a lot of money invested in this, and, and what's the bank for the buck, right? Somehow it's like a return on investment. Is it worthwhile to invest so much money in graphic design, good video editing, does it have an impact on how people learn, how they are engaged emotionally and cognitively in the content? So what did we do? Well, uh, we had the collaboration from, from HSC Montréal in the school to design two versions of the same MOOC, right? And the idea is that this is a between study experiment where we had subjects who attended the same learning, the same content in two versions. One, let's say, low rich version and high rich version of with the same professor, the exact same content of a 14 minutes uh, uh, video clip, right? So obviously, one limit, and we'll come back to that, 
these results right now, they are bound to this fact that we had in lab setting someone watching 14 minutes clip. So we know for sure that MOOCs, they contain much more video uh, than that. But at least the objective here is to understand what happens during 14 minutes, right, of the same content, same instructor, and we picked a, a topic, is the topic of attachment in a course of intro to psychology that we have on, on, on our MOOC here at the university uh, with one of the best professor in psychology, right? So, so the idea was to take, you know, if we keep constant a very good teaching level, what is the impact of having uh, rich video uh, format? So to condition high and low media richness, 14 minutes for, for both, about the same uh, 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 you know, content and duration. Uh, and 38% uh, of female, uh, 62 of male, uh, and we had a pre and post test. So we actually objectively measure what they knew about it before taking this 14 minute video and some objective measure at the end. So to measure this delta of knowledge. And uh, those, this pre and post was designed by expert in the field and we had really a, a very valid way to measure the knowledge acquisition. Uh, so that's, that's about the experiment we ran, right? So we did that uh, last spring. Uh, and uh, so we had the initial version that was designed by uh, the, the team of EduLib here at HEC Montreal of this attachment uh, uh, clip that we had in the larger MOOC of Intro to Psychology. And uh, in this clip, as you can see, a lot of the work had been done by the uh, audiovisual department of building something very rich with graphics and photos and, uh, and uh, so th a lot of work had been done to make this very nice looking uh, video production. So we took the same content and we asked the same professor to go back in class and we refilmed the exact same thing with what you see here, uh, a very static video like, you know, what will be this video at the end of someone talking to a crowd, students there listening, you know, something very cheap to produce and at the end is, you know, what's the effect, right? What, how, what it will be the impact of having just this as the variable that we, uh, that we uh, manipulate. Uh, so what is the uh, instrumentation? So this is my lab, so I have several of these rooms where we're, measure, uh, we're measuring several modalities uh, in, uh, 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 synchronously with a participant that is learning from this video. And so we have here uh, two different types of measure. First of all, the cognitive engagement is measured using EEG. Uh, so EEG measures brain, act brain activities and they are uh, building upon different work from neuro neuropsychology. There is something called the engagement index, which somehow measure the level of uh, mental effort put in a task, which, you know, every time you're doing a task on a computer, there's some level of mental workload that you need, need to uh, exert. Uh, but at some point, if you put too much, it becomes vigilant. So there's like a level of, a moderate level of, of cognitive investment that you must make to learn. Then we have emotional and uh, uh, engagement with two different constructs. One is valence and the other one is arousal. Valence is very easy. Valence means unhappy to happy. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we measured that using automatic facial analysis. In other words, what we do is that the webcam that you have at the top of the computer measures your uh, facial muscle micro expression. It goes something like this, right? So you have a camera and six times per second, there's a machine learning algorithm that measure micro movement and will infer on your different discrete emotion. And on, in total, what it comes to is something like this where you have you see a valence curve where I have a very precise moment of, at this point, for example, the learner has a high valence reaction, and you know later on at 32 seconds, a much lower valence, so let's say a more negative valence. So this is our valence construct. The emotional engagement arousal is the intensity of your emotion, and that is measured using uh, uh, skin conductance. So skin conductance actually measure your uh, uh, when you sweat, you know, it's typically associated with stress uh, and can be measured as the conductivity between the two electrodes and is a pretty, uh, you know, strong construct with regards to measuring the arousal of someone. So taking both together tells a story about, you know, what is the positively, are you positively valence, you know, how much 
Are you happy about what you're learning? And the intensity of the learning is important, right? You, a, a learner that is like drowsing in a classroom, you would see the uh, arousal and the actual electrodermal activity to go flat, you know? Someone who reacts and is engaged, you will see all these little mountains of reaction. In, in effect, this electrodermal activity is like a lie detector. You understand? You see that in movies, right? The polygraph is the same technology. So, the, uh, Let's talk about the results. So, so we have these three constructs, and uh, the very good news uh, overall is from a both emotional and cognitive reaction, the impact of time gives uh, you know, the high richness uh, media a much stronger result. Uh, so let's take, for example, face reader, which provide this balance. So on the, y, on the y axis here, you have the overall on time, you see the, this is the total duration of video. It said the, on average, the, era, the valence of the learner using the high richness media is uh, not only higher, but constant throughout the video. As for the, uh, for the other part, it's still negative, right? We're not, this is not like a, a comedy movie or something, right? You're, you're learning on psychology. So overall, it's not a positively driven, it's mostly a, a somehow neutral. But the, uh, the high richness has a significantly, throughout the video, uh, a significantly higher uh, valence than the low richness. The other part, and that's the most interesting result in, in my view, is this uh, tonic EDA, right? This is the uh, electrodermal activity of the, of, the, of the participant. And early on, uh, and maybe this is due to the uh, human interaction that you get from the low richness, you have a much higher reaction. The arousal at the beginning of video is higher in the group of low richness. But over time, you see how much the low richness video brings the learner in a drowsy mode, right? And at the end, you really see a significant difference in terms of the uh, arousal of the participant. At the end of 14 minutes, you really clearly see how much the high richness video is able over time to keep the learner on its toe, it being able to bring it back into the learning process. So it's not, it's not significant at the beginning and becomes significant at the end. So again, it's a time-driven process by which at, at starting at some time in the process that the high richness plays a very uh, important role. And cognitive engagement, again, is the notion that you have to cognitively invest in the learning process to to learn, uh, and if you're not investing, you're just apathic and you know not uh, putting enough effort to 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 uh, understand what's happening. And what we see here is that over time, uh, so this ratio has been developed by uh, a NASA scientists to measure uh, the cognitive workload of of astronauts. So the idea here is that you want someone that is engage, but not too much, right? At some point, this index becomes vigilance, right? Uh, the way, one of the ways to see that is that, suppose you're, you're driving a car in a city that you know very well, I mean, this is all automatic, and you still need to invest some, some con cognition in, in the driving process, but a lot of it is automatic. If you come in a new city and a lot more stimuli, let's say that you don't drive in New York very often, you will hold your wheel like that and look everywhere. Your high vigilance. And high vigilance is not a mode for, for learning, right? If, if you bring your learner in a vigilance mode, this is not good for the, the learning process. And what we, we see here is that over time, it becomes significant. It's not at the beginning, and over time, the high richness keeps the learner in a process that is more cognitively engaged with the media. But again, this is what happened during. And what we want to know is that, does that impact the, the performance of the learner? And we would have been happy just by the, the, the results of finding that we find a very significant difference during the process. But to our, uh, let's say, we were extremely happy to find that it also impact the pre and post tests. So the delta is actually being predicted by all these three measures. Right? So we find a significant relationship between valence and arousal during the process. So that's a direct effect. And we find a quadriculture relationship. That means it's an inverse U shape. Right? So at some point, you have to invest enough in the, uh, in the cognitive activity. But if you go overboard, vigilance will, will bring a negative effect on, on performance. Performance being like the learning delta from pre and post video. So overall, uh, this for us is uh, a, a very strong 
uh, uh, support for our hypothesis that, uh, that we had initially, that high uh, richness video do have a, an impact on the learning process. So, conclusion of, of that before we take questions. The, the all in all, uh, we, this is obviously an experiment in, in the lab with only one video, 14 minutes. A real MOOC is not exactly like that. Uh, a real MOOC you're intrinsically motivated to attend to. Uh, all of that cannot be controlled in a lab experiment. But what we can control is the fact that the only element that was manipulated here is the richness of the video, right? Everything else was kept constant. And we find that somehow our results are opening many more questions, right? What would happen if we uh, were to, uh, to chunk the video for the, the low richness in chunks of three, four minutes? Do, do we actually keep the link and the, enga in the engagement to the same level? Because we see that something happens after five, six minutes, right? Maybe we don't find anything if we have a reduced uh, duration of video. It's also, you know, you typically would watch many videos when you're attending a typical uh, module on, on, on a MOOC. Uh, so what happened after the second, the third, the fourth? Do we still keep this, this element of the high richness? We don't know to the extent to which it, it would, uh, we, we would continue to see the same results. Uh, but it, it definitely br uh, provides support to the fact that investing in high richness me media, something that maybe you are doing in developing your MOOCs, is worthwhile, right? We, we, f we find that these results at least brings uh, uh, some, some level of support uh, to the sometimes very high budget that we invest in making good MOOCs because it does have it. It seems that it does have an impact. So this is where we are, and uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll, I'm open to questions. If you could just introduce yourself before asking uh, your question, that'd be great. And let me hand you the mic here. Hi, I'm Kabir. I work at Microsoft. Um, I was just wondering if you could go back to the, the EEG uh, cognitive engagement index slide. Um, so I'm just noticing the, the y-axis. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk to how significant this difference actually is. like. I'm just not very familiar with the, the metric. So it's a, it's a ratio that is based on uh, certain, uh, certain uh, frequency, band, frequency bands. Uh, so uh, it's measured from uh, several um, uh, location uh, uh, from the EEG uh, electro electrodes. Uh, the, uh, somehow the ratio should lead to something between 0 and 20 uh, on average. Uh, and uh, the, uh, from the, st uh, the, the test we conducted, what we find here is that times uh, makes uh, a, uh, an in uh, at the end of the process, it's significant. It's not at the beginning, right? So what we find here is that over time, the, the engagement index, there's a growing difference between the two conditions. That is significant. Hi, I'm JPS Kohli uh, from Scale-Up Technologies. So Thank I'd you. like to go to the slide just before this. Just before? <laughs> you want to know if it's significant? Yeah, so this is... <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this one is very interesting. Is like, so in this fact, is the perfect X, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, have you tried, or is, is there a plan to actually combine this, uh, the two strategies, have more uh, talking head video in the beginning, and then later towards the half, the second half, uh, increase the media richness. Does that make a more perfect graph, or you know, did you try that out? Is that a plan? We have not definitely tried that, but it's an interesting uh, idea that uh, one could have from these results the the impact of the human interaction that you get from seeing the, the professor live, uh, and then moving on to a more rich media. Uh, uh, it's an interesting idea, uh, but we definitely haven't tested uh, tested that. Mm -hmm. Video is a big factor, both when I was at Microsoft and now when I'm providing those services. Um, we have been able to have a talking head along with a very faster uh, PowerPoint based uh, animation, which is kind of very cost effective. But the moment you go into whiteboard animation mm -hmm. or any other rich media, I totally agree the cost kind of goes significantly higher. Yeah. But if you add some elements to really low cost, you kind of got very good feedback. But 
interesting. But, uh, we definitely have tested the, the two extreme of a continuum. Uh, when you do experiment, this is what you want to do, right? Testing like the boundaries. And here we really had you know, human only, and in this 40 minutes clips, you'd never see the human, right? You, you just hear the, uh, uh, the, the voice over uh, a rich media. So uh, in a sense, for us, it's the perfect experimental manipulation. But what you bring here is very interesting, like this hybrid approach, we have not tested it, and could be uh, uh, also bring different results than what we have here. Thank you very much. Very good question. Oui, yes. I've got a, a question on this slide as well. Is this saying that the low richness videos are better up to the point of 400 seconds? So for shorter videos, like the lecture styles are more engaging, but after that point, they become less engaging for the, the video watcher? The, the uh, uh, what, I mean, I think these two slides should be seen uh, together. Somehow, overall, we. I mean, starting from the fact that we know that there's a negative valence at the beginning uh, of the process and that is significantly different. So negative here meaning unhappy, right? So when you mix unhappy with tonic EDA, this is not a positive emotion, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's definitely bringing the person on its toe, right? Being like engaged, but uh, that could also be uh, understood as a frustrating experience, right? So when you're highly uh, uh, aroused and negatively balanced, this is not excitement, right? So, but uh, I would not conclude that there is something at 400 milliseconds. I think this the study was not about you know, providing precise measurement of that. To do that, we would need to you know, test short and long clips. But, uh, but there's definitely something different at the beginning, and what you can conclude also from a negative emotion and low arousal, this is apathy. Right? And, and other discrete emotions. So, so somehow the person was not necessarily very happy to see this non-dynamic, non very static scene, and at the end, a somehow uh, got bored in, into doing that. Make sense? The content? It's, a, it's an intro to... Uh, what is the sub the topic, right? Yeah. The topic of the video. So we took from the intro to psychology uh, course that we that we have uh, in in the MOOCs that we provide to our students. We took a uh, segment on attachment theory, which is a theory about the fact that if you develop bonding when you were younger, that it has an impact on on your or organizational uh, relationship, right? So this is a very uh, uh, old uh, theory in psychology, uh, and we, we took that to make sure that we, uh, this is not something that typical business student would, would be aware of, uh, and uh, we wanna make sure that we had low knowledge at the beginning and you know, that the video would provide them some knowledge. So we screened for people that had not attended this intro to psychology, that knew about the theory, we tested them at the beginning and at the end. So that's why we chose this very specific uh, theory in psychology. The only thing we've done is to manipulate those two. So it, between subject experience, we have not tested it with you know, people outside, uh, 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 students that are not in lab context. The, the benefit of a lab experiment is that you all constant, all factor. Uh, doing, you know, a, uh, you know, maybe a study, <laughs> that's my phone. Uh, <laughs> doing a study on a, um, uh, that's, you know, um, <laughs> distracted. Uh, doing, doing a study outside, would, a field study could be a good idea. Just bear in mind that doing like uh, a uh, e, full EEG study as we've done, it's, you know, from a cost perspective, it's kind of very expensive. So that's why typically if you, if you look at psychophysiology type of study, the number of observation that you would find even in top journals is between 20 and 40 subjects. So that's kind of a very uh, typical type of uh, psychophysiology study. like this.
the, the difference of richness of media. And that over co has a cost component to it. Have you, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you've thought, but I'm wondering if there's a way to quantitatively describe or analyze your media to say that this is more rich than something else. Um, I, we realize that you're looking at a talking head versus a, a rich presentation, but how much richer does the media need to be yeah. in order to, to produce this effect? And, and is there some threshold that, that maybe can be used as a guidance or, mm -hmm. or some other thing that allows, because you have to deal with an organization that's going to put money behind this and, and yep. the level of effort, you know, wh what do they do? You know the the five hundred thousand dollar media lab, you know, with a studio and green screen and all that, or do yep. they, you know, have some kit that they can deploy? You know, have you have you looked into this piece? Uh, we have not. I mean, we what we chose for an experiment like this is we chose really two extreme conditions. But you're right. Uh, I mean, it's not black and white, and uh, they uh, there are many ways of making our video red less or more richer. Uh, um, I think it could be you know. Uh, eventually look into uh, future studies. But there are scales for um, uh, media richness. Uh, it, there are self-receive, uh, but that could be one way to, to take a look at this, uh, to try to uh, uh, identify uh, uh, or maybe evaluate from a self-receive standpoint what different experts would, would you know, tell you about the level of different media richness. That would be my take on this. Mm -hmm. Animated yeah. And it's a good question. Yeah. Well, what we did for our studies, we ha specifically had the professor to be very static, right? To to stand in the behind the desk, and you know, so we we would have the highest effect, having a very static, uh, just cam like this in a classroom, compared to a let's say. Uh, a normal rich video with photos, with some graphics, uh, but n seeing no human to really remove the, the effect of seeing uh, the, the human presenter. Was audio synced? Uh, no, the, almost the same. It's very difficult because it was the audio was sync with the, the media. The, the exact same content, right? The, the professor g g gave with teleprompter exactly the same in a, let's say, natural approach. Same voice, same person, but it didn't took exactly the same number of minutes, right? I think it was like 14 something. But, it, but it, with a teleprompter, we made sure that it was exact same content at the end. Yes. Do you have any insight as to how motivation would play a role into a study like this? I'm sure that it would play a role. Uh, here we had participant in a study that were paid to to participate, uh, they had you know no uh, in, in incentive to learn the process, right? So, in some way, it could could be seen as a uh, as a uh, an, as an element that would be a let's say um, a weakness of the study, but it could be seen as a strength, right? So we we have here again in, in an experiment. It's uh, Latin expression would be chitteris paribus, right? So it's everything all, all constant. So. All the subjects were not motivated to, to learn this. They were paid to actually learn it. Uh, so, you know, if we hold that constant, we see an effect. Uh, seeing that with real student motivated, uh, there, the problem with doing studies with real student, there's an ethics uh, component that uh, going to involve student in psychology experiment, you have, you know, some influence power over them. Uh, so it's typically very difficult to involve real student from real classroom, and then uh, one, what could be argued, for example, if they're not at the same level at the entry of, so there, there are weaknesses in many uh, aspects. I, I think that in the end, this is a strength, right? We know of none of the students who were motivated at learning this, they were paid to do so, and still we see an effect. Uh, we have time for one more quick question. Thank you. Uh, Richard Weber from Stanford. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, hopefully this is a quick question and quick answer. You mentioned that the pre and post testing indicated an improvement. Yep. Uh, can you quantify that? I'm wondering how much better was the um, 
with the learning? I don't have it with me. It was a significant improve for all groups. Uh, uh, you know, whether you were in the low or rich, they all learned something and were able to answer these objective questions in the end. But I, I don't have them with me. I guess the question sort of motivated by is similar to how much you actually invest. The, the one half of the equation would be how much do you invest and how far do you have to go to get the benefit. Mm -hmm. And then it's effectively a cost benefit analysis, right? How much do you put in yep. in terms of richness of media and what percentage improvement by exactly. some measure do you yep. get in terms of learning? Yep. It, the, what they can report is there was a significant difference, uh, uh, but very difficult to quantify, especially if it was only a 14 minutes clip. Thank you for a good question. And our intention is to go uh, the next step and obviously to write the scientific paper to, uh, around that. Currently, we're looking into computer and education as a possible outlet to send our paper. So if, if ever you have better idea, you can send me an email <laughs> as a suggestion of where we should be sending this paper. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. So we're, 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 nevertheless, we're very happy to be uh, sharing this last presentation with you. And uh, the subject of our presentation is one of those bewildering ones. You know, basically it's about blockchain and how to build stuff at scale uh, with open edX. Uh, we're gonna do very few slides and we're gonna do more presentations. So hopefully you can actually learn. We're not gonna tell you much about what we do. Just basically we're gonna tell you a lot more about how we do it. So, first order of the day. Today is a very special day for us. We launched our first course on, on edX.org today. Uh, it is how to build a chatbot and make money. Make money being the important part and to help people make money, we're making a special offer for those people who get into this and turn this into a business. We will spot you for 10 chatbots for a year uh, of the service that creates the chatbots called Watson uh, Assistant. So I recommend you go there, tell your families, friends, you know, mother-in-law, everybody. Okay, all, all are welcome. So what do we do? So we're a team from IBM and uh, we got into this business of helping people learn uh, and you know, basically in the business of democratizing access to skills around data engineering, big data, uh, around uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, um, anything that's new, blockchain, and so on. Uh, so we run this property called cognitiveclass.ai. Everything in there is free, and like free as in beer. Uh, and uh, we don't teach you much about IBM technologies. We teach you everything that you want to know about all technologies. But we also give you IBM resources for you to be uh, to be able to learn. So what we're trying to get, help people do is progress from gaining hands-on skills. So we're very big on hands-on. We're not an academic environment. We're actually teaching hands-on skills. And progress from hands-on skills towards getting a, some kind of a credential. So, and what we do with these credentials is we put them out on the blockchain so they stay with you forever. You own, the, you, you own the credential, and it'll be guess written on the blockchain. So we're gonna talk a lot more about the blockchain at the end of this presentation. Uh, but let's first get to the point of how we started that in this business. So we've been doing this since uh, uh, August of 2011, and this is when we realized that we needed to create a MOOC or a series of MOOCs, and it progressed from having a MOOC to having a platform for MOOCs. And as we all know, as you get, you go from one MOOC to a platform of MOOCs and you have many of them, you get, start to get some pains with scaling. And we definitely, before we were on Open edX, we were on another CMS and we certainly felt the pain. So we had to make some kind of a decision of what, how we're gonna go forward. So what we also did is as we were, as we were trying to get, uh, as we were starting to reach very large numbers, and just to give you an idea of where we are today, so we have uh, about a million registered learners with us. Uh, we have about uh, one point, almost 1.9 million uh, course enrollments. Uh, I'm gonna do this from memory, roughly 450,000 course completions, and we should certificates and, and badges for those. Uh, our NPS is about 52. NPS is, stands for Net Promoter Score. That's how we measure the, you know, how much people like us or, or not. So apparently people do like us. But the point is we got to a certain level of scale where we were attracting a lot of people from a lot of our commercial customers. So their employees were coming and learning and our commercial customers were asking us a question. So can I know what, our employee, what my employees are learning? And our answer was, uh, no, you can't. Because these are independent learners. They're coming to us to learn not necessarily wanting you, your ma you know, their manager to know what they're learning. But we said, we can, we can create a white labeled platform for you. And that's one of the things we've done is we actually white label our entire platform, our entire course catalog, and we give it to our clients, which are universities and, and, and uh, commercial clients and so on. So with that, we, faced a, a number of challenges, specifically enterprise integration, things like single sign-on became very important. Uh, we, we needed to get support for the learners and it had to be integrated, so not emailing somebody in the organization asking questions. 
Uh, we absolutely needed to uh, issue certificates and badges and other credentials because that's one of the reasons people go to learn because they want to see some evidence or provide some evidence that they've learned. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, our, our our clients, our corporate clients specifically, are very focused on maintaining their brand and identity and the configuration. But more important, having the materials and learning experiences coincide and be tailored to their corporate objectives. So those are the, the key challenges we faced. Now, to create each one of those, and because IBM has been around for a while and we have a lot of customers, we needed to create these things very, very quickly, you know, at the snap of a finger, so to speak. And uh, we have customers who are quite demanding, so some of them are okay with us hosting it for them. The others wanted everything to reside behind their firewall, and we need to satisfy both requirements. And last but not least, I mentioned already that we're very big on hands-on learning as opposed to just uh, you know, uh, instructional uh, materials that are delivered to you in, in, in a lecture form. Everything we do is practiced, hands-on. So we needed to make sure that the labs to do that were integrated into the courses. And we needed to make sure that they did not require downloads, configuration, installation, and all that other stuff that goes with that, you know, where you spend 75% of your time just do the 25% of the work. So first thing first, or sorry, last thing first. The first thing we did is we added integrated labs into our environment. The way our labs work right now, you can see it here, is, uh, well, Hopefully you can see it here. Uh, there is a button right within the course. So this is your typical edX uh, or open edX based course. There's a button right there that says start the lab. What happens in there is, or what doesn't happen in there, is it doesn't tell you, oh, you need to reserve time. What also doesn't happen in there, it doesn't tell you, oh, you need to go get some account someplace and here's the coupon for it or something like that. It is immediate and it's, it's in context. So you click start the lab, you know, a little spinner goes up, and in a, few, in a few seconds, you get the full lab environment like that one over there working. You can continue to work in there right within the lab. If this is not enough screen real estate for you, there is a, no, there is no, there, there is no, uh, there is pointing. Yeah, there, you probably can't see this, but it says there's something in there that says full screen. It goes and takes full screen. You don't want a full screen, you don't do that, okay? So in this particular case, the lab is within something called Jupyter Lab. Some of you may know this environment, a, pre, a precursor to this environment called Jupyter Notebooks. So this is Jupyter Notebooks Plus, okay? But th that's, that's how we handle labs. So another problem. So this is how we they, they solved the problem number four. Another challenge was about creating these, uh, this, uh, uh, white labeled portals. So our decision to go ahead and, and address this was by creating a network, a network of these uh, skills, uh, private skills instances. And at the center of this network is this, where we place this, something we call skills asset catalog. That's basically our catalog of courses, tutorials, and other materials. Now what we do then is we syndicate this out to a, a number of our clients and partners. So this can be university partners. Uh, this can be startup accelerators. We work with a number of them. This can be other MOOCs and other training providers. What we're also doing is we have our own uh, digital you know, platforms. And Cognitive Class.ai is one of them. So the, the key point in here is we needed to create a, a, a syndication mechanism where we're able to put this out in, in, uh, at scale. So this is how it's implemented. Uh, what you're seeing in your screens right now is uh, on your right is the actual skills network. And you see these stacked cars. That means these, the, the, these stacked cards, each one represent, each, you know, each card in a stack represents one of these private uh, skills uh, instances whether it's a client or a university or uh, as a, a provider. And, they all, and they're all fed from this uh, box on the, on the left, which is the place where the authoring, uh, the uh, curation, and syndication happens. 
So how does this relate to the open uh, edX? All of those, every single one of those uh, uh, private instances, skills instances, each one of them is an instance of open edX. Okay, and it's private and dedicated to a particular client. Everything you see, uh, you know, you see in there it says some, a box says CMS and LMS over here. That is open edX. That open edX implements the authoring, and that is Studio, as we all know it. We do curation in Studio as well, and what we've developed in here for syndication, that's our own add-on. Now, what's really important for us is to know how this entire burgeoning network is working. So we have a performance management system that allows our authors to understand how well each course is performing, and allows us, in general, to understand how well the, the, uh, the overall network is performing, each one of these skills instances. This is what one of those skills instances looks like. This particular one is for Cornell uh, University. It's our partnership with them. You'll notice in here, if you look uh, carefully at the picture, um, not much in there. Everything is skinned and done specific to Cornell. So it has all of their branding. And what you'll see behind the scenes in there, we're going to take you to another portal right now, uh, is it's fully customized and organized for the needs of that particular, so in this particular case, Cornell. So what do they get in that instance? Uh, you get both CMS and LMS, so open edX. You get a management console to manage it all, and, and Rob is going to go demonstrate this uh, to you in a, in a minute. Uh, you get uh, your own course catalog, which is a subscription that gets fed from our uh, central or, or worldwide uh, uh, catalog of courses. And the way this works is very much the same as the Apple App Store or Google Play Store works. So think of our global catalog of, uh, of content as being similar to the Apple App Store. Think of your iPhone or an Android phone as being the, uh, is equivalent to e each one of these uh, instances. And you're able to select things that you want to pull onto, your, pull onto your phone or to pull onto your instance in this particular case. Or you're able to choose which updates you apply or don't apply. And you're able to choose new things and get them and brought them over to your platform. So that's kind of the way it works. So it also includes all the virtual lab environment. So those hands-on labs that I was demonstrating. So your students are able, or our students are able to start learning right away. Uh, it also includes a competition management system. We say it's like Kaggle, but for in-house competitions. So it's the same, it actually is exactly like Kaggle, but you can retain full control of your competition. So you can run it behind the firewall and not have the stuff uh, hidden. Uh, so great, great thing. You know, a lot of our clients would like to participate in Kaggle competitions, but can't because of reasons of privacy and compliance. A lot of universities want to do joint competitions with their clients, but can't do this in Kaggle. So this, is, this provides a way of, of doing that. Uh, and then there's a, a built-in and integrated support and ticketing system. So anybody who has a complaint to do, they can do this immediately. Uh, So I'll, I'll pass the baton over to Rav, and he'll actually show you how we create this stuff. All right, so um, the way we provision our instances is, these private skills instances is that uh, once we get a request from a client or a partner or an academic institution, we basically create a GitHub issue. Uh, just fill in the name of um, just fill in the name of uh, the instance. So in this case, it's um, for Drump University, a fictional university called Drump University, the science of the deal. Um, they can have, the client can have their own domain. So in this case, it's drump.deal. And location, well, in this case, it's, you know, we can pick Washington, D.C., um, let me just show you that. Is it Chrome or Firefox? Uh, 
<laughs> Never mind. Okay. So, you know, I'll just delete the other data centers. So, we have IBM data centers worldwide and um, IBM Cloud. So, we can just, you know, pick the one we want. Um, specify a due date. I'm not going to do that for in the interest of time. But the idea is that as simple as that, you just fill in a few fields, click on submit the, the issue, and we kick up an automated process that does the deployment. It's, uh, and, and, and Louise will talk a little bit more about, you know, what happens behind the scenes. So we do the deployment of the private skills instance that is based on Open edX. Uh, we test it, um, the e name and the email that's specified, the contact that's specified gets notified, and you're pretty much in business shortly afterwards. Um, So I'm going to show you a private instance, a private skills instance that we've uh, created for uh, as a for a demo, and in this case, it's a uh, for University of Antarctica, where polar bears and penguins go to learn. So this is, this is what it looks like. Once it's been provisioned, uh, you don't see all of this stuff that needs to be added, but what we've done is we've built an interface that takes the complexity out of white labeling uh, open edX environment. Um, so if I go into the admin interface here, you know, you're specifying the title, the name, you put in your text and images for the landing pages, and you know you don't need a web development uh, sophisticated web development credentials or any you know, technical skills any business user can essentially do all of this that is white labeling your environment you upload a logo for um, whoever you're white labeling this for and uh, header footer and then as uh, leon mentioned we have a catalog of courses, a global catalog of courses, but a client who wants to access the information, uh, wants to get a copy, you know, if they're interested in a specific course, they can simply go click on get button. And what that's going to do is get the course from our global catalog and install it in the private instance of open edX that we've just provisioned for that client. And this happens in a matter of uh, a couple of minutes usually. And then just like, you know, the concept of an app store and iPhone, it shows you the courses that, that have already been installed and available for your users to see in your environment. Now, okay, so that's a list of installed courses. The, in, in order to create programs or learning paths or pathways, we've built another interface on top that lets you quickly and easily um, create new learning paths, which are essentially collections of courses. So you fill in a little bit of the information, and then it shows you all of the courses that you have available in the catalog that you've installed in your private instance of the catalog. You just, you know, let's say you're doing something on Hadoop, so you just drag the Hadoop-based courses over. Um, so here's another one on Hadoop. And so, this, so now you have, if you create that learning path, you have a pathway, let me actually call it. So let's say Hadoop 101. So now if I go on top, just name it 
Hadoop. And I create that learning path. It shows up in here. And if I go back to the website, it's pretty instantaneous. I don't have an I don't have an icon for it, but I can do that. So here that Hadoop learning path has just appeared. And if I go into that learning path, I now have three courses in there. Hadoop 101, accessing Hadoop using Hive, and controlling Hadoop jobs using UZ. So let me go back to the admin console. So Leon talked about competitions. That's where you go and configure the competitions. Um, the integrated learner support, and then we have reports and analytics around. Uh, so, for example, managers can see which of their employees are taking which courses, whether they've completed the course or not, etc. Uh, we can configure things so that anyone can access this private skills network, or uh, if you are in a particular company, you might only want people from that company to access it. So you can do that. You can also integrate with uh, SSO, your, your own SSO environment, or you can have a list of users who are allowed to access this content. So this is basically a, um, an uh, environment where you can very, very easily, easily access um, easily customize white label and customize an open edX environment. So it's a layer of veneer on top that uh, anyone who doesn't, doesn't have open edX skills, doesn't need to know any deep technical skills, any business user can go ahead and do this. So, I'm gonna, gonna pass it over to Louise now, who's gonna to talk to you about you know, what we showed you was, seemed very simple and easy to do, but it's a lot more sophisticated, and Louise was gonna talk about what's behind the scenes. Thank you, Rav. Uh, so right after Rav clicked the submit button for the GitHub issue, what happens behind is that a event's gonna get triggered, uh, and it's gonna kick off a script that is gonna deploy the new portal. Uh, now, once the port is deployed, you get this uh, spaghetti bow, uh, which essentially we use a microservice architecture, so every box you see there is a service. Uh, it's hard to read, but you're, you're gonna recognize things like LMS, CMS, they're all individual services, uh, the MongoDB, MySQL, and we also have our own uh, add-ons to the platform, so the competitions and the, the support system uh, are also separate boxes, so everything is dockerized, so each of those boxes are one or multiple Docker containers. Uh, and we kicked that, kicked that off by running an Ansible playbook, basically. Uh, that it's gonna configure the infrastructure, so it's gonna provision hardware if required. So if we need more servers uh, to host our infrastructure, it's gonna get one. It's gonna configure DNS, uh, you know, set up the proper domains for the portal. It's gonna grab certificates, like TLS certificates for SSL, uh, it's going to wait for them to be generated and integrated into the portal. Uh, it's going to configure the lab instance. So all of our uh, private skills, they, they talk to the, to the lab behind the scenes. It's going to configure that as well. And it's going to provision everything. Once it's done, it's going to notify us that it's ready. And we just move forward back to, uh, to have whoever is responsible for, uh, for that instance. Uh, and I, yeah, I think that's it. I'm not gonna go back to Leon. He's gonna explain about what we're doing with blockchain. Right. So just uh, just to complete what uh, Luis was uh, saying, you know, we actually would, we don't really have much time to actually show you what's behind the scenes. But this is a fairly sophisticated system. There's a container-based uh, uh, orchestration system in there that provisions this load balances, moves stuff around. You saw the spaghetti in there. That, that's an actual, we use, a, uh, we use a, a protocol called Rancher. And the Rancher is the way we use for you know, man managing the catalog and, and deploying all of this out. 
So, but what about the blockchain? So we have five minutes, and, and I wanted to leave at least a couple of minutes for, for questions. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of talk during this conference and in, uh, you know, in the industry in general. What are we going to do with credentials? And it, that, that, that talk is driven by two factors. One is uh, credential management, credential issuing, creation, cre credential custo custody are fairly complex issues with a lot of dollar signs assigned to them. That's one. Number two is um, we don't do this very well. There are people, because there's a lot of dollar signs assigned to it, there are people who will issue fake credentials. You know, diploma mills is a huge industry. I believe it's $2.4 billion in the U.S. alone. That's a lot of money. Okay, this is, not, this is not somebody in the basement just photoshopping a certificate. This is people making incredible money from manufacturing this. And by the way, the biggest consumer of fake certification credentials is U.S. government employees. Just, just a little... Uh, because to qualify for specific job levels, you need to have a specific level of education. So you need to produce the credentials. It you know, stands to reason that they shop for them, right? But the last piece, and it's probably the most important one, everybody heard about Bitcoin, okay? So that drives a lot of interest in blockchain. And then we try to apply blockchain to everything. So one of those everythings is academic credentials. So we took up that challenge as well, but it took it up from a different point. We, we actually came up from a need point of view, not because Bitcoin is so popular or everybody wants to do a blockchain. And our need was very simple. Just like edX.org, just like many of you, we issue a lot of credentials. I, th I said we issued about 425 or 450,000 of these course completion certificates. And guess what happens when people get the course completion certificate? Anybody? They put it on LinkedIn. What happens next? So one person puts it on LinkedIn, 100 people the very same day download it to their Photoshop, change the name, and upload it back to their profile. Okay, that's a problem. Okay? And it happens in every country, by the way. Don't look towards Asia. It happens everywhere. Why do they do that? Because unlike traditional universities and academic institutions, which are able and charge a lot of money to validate the credential on the order of about $80 for validation, and it takes about two months to get it validated by an employer, nobody calls Coursera, nobody calls edX, nobody calls us to validate it. You have to take it at face value. So I call these people who do that. I, 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 I call them credentials artists or diploma artists because they're very creative. And by the way, sometimes they don't take other people's certificates. They take their own. They may pass one course and a substitute name for a different course because they're applying for a different job. So that's a problem we wanted to solve. But the bigger problem we also wanted to solve is everybody today in this day and age, especially with you know, uh, all the scandal around data privacy and who owns the data and is, you know, do, are, are Googles and Facebooks of the world have too much control, we thought that this problem applies uh, in spades to the, to the problems of, of credentials. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of return the data and return the credentials back to the rightful owners. Why should it be owned by LinkedIn? Why should it be owned by Google? Why shouldn't it be owned by you, the person who earned it? So that's what we tried to do. So we created this uh, method and implementation for anybody who is running open edX to be able to create credentials on the blockchain. We call this blockchain Documentorum. It is not ours. It is something that we're doing as a consortium and we're inviting other people to participate in that consortium. So we have, we have no desire or, uh, to go and control it. There are many, too many people who are trying to control the blockchain. It's not going to happen. So we're trying to do it the other way around. We're trying to create a community around this, and nobody and everybody be, should, should be owning that. So uh, Luis actually is the author of the, uh, uh, of the X block that you can use to add to your uh, OpenEdX 
site to start writing the certificates onto the blockchain. And then we're also inviting people who create applications to create applications on top of that blockchain. So this basically tells you where we are. We run this as a POC. Um, our next steps is to build the, uh, the, the block, uh, the, to, to build the consortium and to make open, uh, uh, open source the code. Apparently I'm out of time. So I, I thank you all for sticking around for this long and discovering us uh, on the agenda. So uh, hopefully this was uh, useful uh, for you. And, and as we we're doing the presentation, I realized we committed a kernel sin. We did not provide our contact information anywhere on the slides. So uh, we, we're gonna have to figure out how to do that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to run out of here because I have a meeting to go to, but I, uh, hopefully uh, Louise and Raf can stick around and answer questions. Thank you.